I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case Chamber of Commerce of the United States versus the United States Department of Labor. This is a 1999 case from the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. And here we're gonna be talking about exceptions to section 553 of the Administrative Procedure Act for general statements of policy. So this is a case that's a lead case in my casebook for statutory interpretation and regulation or WEGREG. It's also discussed and, or appears in a lot of administrative law casebooks. And this is about the issue with notice and comment rulemaking the, the agencies normally have to follow for what we normally call informal rulemaking for promulgating regulations. And under the Administrative Procedures Act, there's a couple of exceptions. And one is for general statements of policy. And agencies will sometimes make sort of a de facto rule um, and try to do it through a general statement of policy. And that's what the parties alleged here. So let's look at what happens in this uh, case. Now, our main takeaway, in case you lose interest or give up on this video, is that the force of law test is the most common approach that courts use to distinguish general policy statements from regulations. And so, in other words, the APA has an exception to the notice and comment rulemaking requirement for just general policy announcements by an agency. They don't have to do notice and comment rulemaking for general policy statements or announcements, but they would for a regulation. And so the question then is, how do we know when something is merely a general statement of policy, a general policy statement instead of a regulation? Because if the agency can skip a bunch of steps and save a lot of time, maybe they'll just call everything a general policy statement. So courts have had to come up with different rubrics for deciding when does something really that an agency puts out really count as a rule or a regulation and when is it just a policy announcement. And the primary test or the most popular one that's illustrated in this case is the force of law. Does that rule in effect function as a law or have the force of law? At the same time, uh, courts don't apply the force of law test consistently. So just because we settle on the force of law test doesn't solve all our problems because the force of law test seems to mean different things to different people or is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. So the meaning of the phrase force of law ends up varying from case to case. Our agency here is OSHA, uh, and which is part of the Department of Labor. And the, um, so this is OSHA focuses, as its name suggests, on occupational safety and hazards. And they tried to adopt a more effective strategy for addressing workplace health and safety. And in this case, this is really about hazardous waste exposure at the workplace. And so in the 1990s, OSHA developed um, a, something that they called the Cooperative Compliance Program, or CCP. And uh, the basically participating companies who are part of regulated industries would agree to follow a set of protocols. They would agree up front to follow the set of protocols for handling hazardous waste in the workplace. And these protocols were, were sort of extra cautious or extra safe. They went above and beyond what existing statutes or regulations required. And, um, and under the cooperative compliance program, the OSHA and participating companies would engage in a series of informal, informal, ongoing, sorry, sorry, informal consultations rather than rely on intrusive site inspections. In other words, you have a choice, right? Normally OSHA is just gonna show up and want a tour of the facility and they're gonna have like uh, clipboards and checklists that they're doing and so forth. And so site inspections can be intimidating and they also take time. Um, sometimes the plant will essentially not be able to operate very well while it, there's an internal audit or site inspection going on. And so instead of that, you could, have a series of meetings with OSHA officials and hash out what you're going to do about your hazardous waste that shows that you are um, going above and beyond, that you're being in the extra cautious or elite category for safety. And the substantive requirements, though, would be more flexible and adjustable over time. In other words, because this was an ongoing informal process, um, OSHA might come back and say, actually, we would like you to do this. Or a company might con contact OSHA officials and say, 
we um, need to change our procedures uh, just a little bit. Um, by the way, this CCP was part of a Clinton era push across the federal government for something that they called reinventing government. In other words, agencies were striving for a more cooperative and less adversarial relationship with regulated industries. And so instead of just command and control regulation, we started to get negotiated rulemaking and, um, and these types of programs where uh, it, they would sort of enter into a memorandum of understanding or almost a, a, a contract or a binding contract with a particular corporation or company um, to do certain things that satisfy the goals, um, the safety goals of the agency um, outside of the enforcement context. So participating in the CCP in this program meant following stricter safety regulations and would otherwise be required. So a lot of employers would not want to participate in the program just voluntarily. And so OSHA announced as sort of an incentive that those who participating in the program would be much less likely to have random or surprise inspections. In fact, OSHA said that it was going to compile an internal list of high priority inspection targets and that participants in this program would definitely not be on that list. So that's pretty motivating, right? This meant, but if you weren't on the list, this was really bad news if you didn't participate, because this meant that as more firms participated in the program, that those who did not would have more and more of the surprise inspections. So if we're gonna keep doing the same number of inspections, but we're removing part of the regulated industry from the inspection list because they're participating in this program, then the ones who remain are getting all the inspections. So even if participating in the program meant some extra work for a company, the hassle of frequent site inspections would be even worse. So this meant that most employers would now have a very strong incentive to join. So in other words, um, there was a little bit of a carrot and a stick here uh, to the program. And OSHA announced this policy through a document that the agency called a policy statement and did not do notice and comment rulemaking. They didn't publish it in the federal register and have a public notice period and then do a final rule and so forth like the APA or Administrative Procedure Act requires. And so some companies claimed that this was in fact, or a rule, it's a de facto rule, and that it was therefore invalid if the agency did not follow Section 553 processes of publishing in the Federal Register a notice of rulemaking and a proposed rule, and then allow a public comment period and so forth. And the Chamber of Commerce, which is a type of trade association, sued on behalf of these employers. OSHA claimed on its side that its program directive actually didn't have the force of law because employers suffered no direct legal sanction for failing to participate in the, in the program. In other words, you weren't gonna be fined. Um, you weren't gonna be shut down or be the target of an enforcement action. You were just gonna be inspected more often. And so they said, an inspection is not a sanction. If we don't find any violations, then right, if you have nothing to hide, then why are you afraid of inspections? OSHA would say. And so they would say, an inspection is not a sanction. It's just um, inconvenient, right? And um, it takes a little time out of uh, a workday that you are planning. And so even so, the agency's policy was binding, not on the industry, but on itself. All OSHA employees had to follow the policy. In other words, there was no... Um, it, it, discretion for individual inspectors or OSHA staff. So if you're an OSHA inspector and you notice a certain plant and you realize or have heard kind of rumors that there's violations at that plant, if they're not on the list, uh, the high priority list, you're not gonna, you don't get to just decide, I better inspect them and make sure that nothing's um, going on over there. And so it, the agency itself was treating this internally at, as if it was a rule for its own people, its own staff. So even without a direct legal sanction on private parties for violations, the directive functionally was binding enough to satisfy the court that it was operating as a rule or regulation that indirectly imposed inconvenient inspections. And uh, because we're doing more inspections, we're more likely to find violations. So your risk of facing penalties um, has really gone up. Here's a quote I pulled out uh, for you from the holding in case you'd like to highlight things in your casebook. The directive was a standard uh, subject to 
a judicial review. This was not a mere procedural rule or a general statement of policy, which would be exempt from notice and comment. And it was a substantive rule. So notice and comment was necessary, which means that they, the court um, vacated this directive or this policy. And um, so where does this leave us? Well, whether an agency's line drawing um, has the force of law is the most common way for courts to distinguish mere policy statements from substantive rules. So if an agency tries to rely on a text as its basis for any enforcement action or activities, it's a rule and not just a statement of policy. At the same time, courts, let's be honest, do not apply this force of law test consistently. And the meaning of the phrase force of law seems to vary from case to case and court to court. So it sounds like we have a rule um, that's going to work and that we can apply uh, across cases, but the fact is the rule itself is still fraught with a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, which means if when you're in practice, if you have a case like this, the outcome, going into it, the outcome is uncertain. It's unclear what a court will do and how they would, even if they apply the force of law um, test, uh, when the agency is claiming that something that they're doing is just a statement of policy and you're in, in the your client, let's say, thinks it's actually in practice a rule, um, it's not clear what the court is going to do, how it's going to apply this force of law test. And that concludes our lecture about the Chamber of Commerce case.